Uh, we want to welcome you to Restoration Life. If you're watching us online, we're honored that you're with us. If, it's, if, if, if you're in Washington at our campus in Washington, we want to welcome you today as well. We know that sometimes you guys log in and we're honored by everybody that's here. How many glad for what God did over the resurrection weekend, right? Our Spanish ministry had a phenomenal time as well. And the reality is this, we need to make more room for what God wants to do at Restoration Life. That's just a hardcore truth. We, we did have a little bit of a setback on some things that I want to fill you in on real quick. We were supposed to open our midweek campus uh, in Torrance. We just found out last week that um, the facility that's been a, a church for almost 100 year, years is actually going to be leveled and they're going to turn it into condominiums. So it's kind of a heartbreak. Um, we were really hoping that uh, the community would win there. Uh, so they're going to be actually transforming the church uh, into condominiums there. And uh, there wasn't anything that we could do about it. They were pretty set on doing it. The city approved it. And so it's a bit of a setback for us in opening up our Torrance campus. Uh, but we still have a couple of options that we're looking at. So would you pray for the Torrance campus? Would you lift that up? Uh, to Jesus and just God open the doors that you want open we've we've got a couple of things that we're gonna um, uh, that we're gonna pursue and see if if, if God's in it or not and uh, so that's gonna that's not gonna stop us from reaching the community come on in Torrance for Jesus we're gonna just continue to do that um, but we also need to make more room here at Restoration Life there's a couple of things that we've been thinking about we've been thinking about opening up more services um, for more people to be able to fit on, you know, in our campus and on campus. And we've also actually even thought about, believe it or not, remodeling our sanctuary so it fits twice the amount of people that it sits now. Now, you might ask, how is that possible? We're working on that so we can show it to you and present it to you and uh, see what the Lord wants to do through it. Come on, anybody excited about your church growing? You know what church growth is? You know, I, 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 I've got an email and I've received letters and texts and people always say, you know, Pastor, it's not about the numbers. And the reality is, you're right. It's not about the numbers to glorify yourself as a church and say, look at how big we are. Uh, we're all about the numbers because we're trying to fill heaven with souls. We're all about reaching people for Jesus. And so we're not about church growth for the sake of saying, you know, look at how big we are. You know, we're all about church growth for the sake of reaching as many people with the love of Jesus Christ and watching God move in their family and just give them a new legacy that they didn't have before. And so we are about growing, but right now uh, our sanctuaries are, 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 you know, our services are packing out and we have to make more room, which is a good, pro it's a problem, but it's a good problem to have. And uh, um, if we don't stay in front of it, then we are not going to be faithful to what God has called us to do, which is to reach the lost, to restore the broken, to restore right relationship, and to release people into their God-given destiny. And so we want to continue to do that. We're not going to stop doing that. Um, I, you know, I wish, you know, if you guys play the lotto, play the lotto. Um, um, if you win, give me the ticket as an offering. I promise you, I'll buy us a brand new building somewhere where we could all fit, okay? So can you erase that from the video? I just I wasn't kidding. If you have your Bibles, open to Matthew chapter 27. You could click on that on your app. I really believe that Resurrection Weekend is um, too powerful of a message not to keep talking about. And, um, you know, we don't want to stop talking about the resurrection on Easter. I just really felt in my heart that we needed to continue to talk about what happened on Good Friday, what happened on Saturday, and what happened on Sunday. And then the aftermath of that so that we can all kind of stay on track with you know, what God did, um, what God is doing today, and what God's going to do tomorrow. So in Matthew chapter 27, it's an interesting portion of Scripture. We've read it before. But how many know that we, we need to keep the story right about Jesus Christ and his resurrection? I, I, I remember reading this article about this grandfather. Any grandfathers in the house? Okay, whatever. Um, Woohoo! One here. Uh, uh, about this grandfather and his daughter and he wanted to find out how well she knew the story of the resurrection and so he went up to her put her uh on his lap and he said hey tell me about what you know about the resurrection and she says well jesus um went to the cross on a friday he died and um they buried him in a borrowed tomb and on sunday um he resurrected from the dead 
and the grandfather was super stoked about what the granddaughter had said, so he was really proud of her. And then she continued to say, and then when Jesus came out of, the, if Jesus were to come out of the tomb and he saw his shadow, then he, they knew that winter would be around for six more weeks. And so the grandfather was a little bit disgruntled at that. But the reality is this, a lot of people have heard about the resurrection but don't know all the dynamics that took place at the resurrection. And some people have even has gone as far as making up more stuff. Today, I just want to look at what the scripture says and the evidence that's found in scripture that validates one of the most foundational truths of our Christian faith, that Jesus Christ did die on a Friday and that he arose on a Sunday. And we need to know this because we need to be able to defend it. And it is foundational to our faith in Jesus. And as you look at the Bible and you read the different stories and you listen to all the accounts, there's so much evidence that proves that the resurrection um, took place. And so as we look at this, we need to know that if it never happened, that if it never, ever happened, the Christianity basically collapses into mythology. And it's one big nasty hoax that has been deceiving people for thousands of years. And I'm talking about it's deceived billions of people for thousands of years, if that's the case. If it never happened, it collapses into mythology. But if it did happen, if it genuinely happened, then it authenticates everything Jesus did, everything Jesus said, and believers, you and I, have a guarantee of eternal life and the forgiveness of all of our sins. Let me say it as strongly as the Apostle Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 15, 17. He said, if Christ has not been raised, if Jesus did not come back from the dead, your faith, my faith, our faith, our church, and all that it does is worthless. That's how intense this truth is and has to be. So I'd like to argue a couple things when you look at the resurrection. Um, because it, it's either the most wicked, heartless, vicious hoaxes of all time. Or it is the most fantastic and epic truth that has happened in all of history. And today I want to declare to you that Jesus is alive. Our God is not dead. He is alive. And I want to show you overwhelming proof. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at Good Friday a little bit closer. And we're going to look at the tomb a little bit closer. And we're going to talk about some things that maybe you haven't thought about. But I just thought we're in no hurry to transition into another series, which is already on our hearts to do. But we're, no real, we're not in any real hurry to transition into that because we want everybody to know and understand and testify that God's not dead. Come on. He is alive. He is alive. And so I want to show you this overwhelming proof. Found, and in fact, in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, Jesus states, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Jesus convinced a lot of people that he was dead and now he's alive. And that's what I intend to try and do this morning as we present all this evidence to you guys. The first thing that's found in the evidence of the resurrection is the empty tomb. The Bible teaches us that professional executioners made sure that not only they tortured Jesus on Friday, but they also made sure that Jesus would die on that Friday. Not only did they beat him, but they stabbed him in the side. The story goes that uh, water and blood flowed from his side. He gave up his last breath, and he said to the Father, you know, he said it is finished. All that took place. He died on that Friday. They didn't have to break his legs. And, and some of you may have wondered, well, why did they break the legs of the other two criminals? The reason why they broke the other two criminals' legs is because they hadn't died as of yet. And, and their legs were able to push up against 
one of the one of the pieces of wood on their cross to help them breathe as they were crucified. But the moment they would they break their legs, they wouldn't be able to push back up and to be able to take another breath. So as their legs were broken and they didn't have the capacity to push up off of it, their lungs would not have the capacity to expand. They would asphyxiate and die in that moment or in, in, in that time period. They didn't have to do that to Jesus' legs because he died on that Friday night. They died. When they went to take him off that cross, he was already dead. Joseph of Arimathea went and got his body, wrapped it up tight, make sure that they anointed the body for the, for, for the, for the burial. They, they anointed him with oils and with spices, and they wrapped his face with cloth. And the, So the Bible is pretty clear that Jesus was dead on, his, on Friday, and his, course, his corpse, his dead, lifeless body, mutilated um, beyond recognition, um, was wrapped up and, and set to be buried in a rock-solid tomb. And so uh, Matthew 27, 62 says it this way. It says, the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. They said, sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver, Jesus, said that in three days I will rise again. Now you have to remember um, what the atmosphere was like in Jerusalem at that time. You have to remember that they have gone through the Passover, um, that the Roman um, guard was there, Pontius Pilate was there to make sure that all dominion was established, that the Jews would not rebel against them in trying um, to regain their own freedom. And so it was still a hot spot. Um, bad things could still happen. And so it was a, there was a lot of tension in the air. Barabbas has just been let go, a common criminal. All these things were all happening and firing off at the same time. And, and, and these legalistic, religious Pharisees went and told Pontius Pilate, listen, if we're not careful something can happen to his body. And then the story of him being resurrected back to life could be looked upon as a true event. And so in verse 64, he says, so give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he had been raised from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Now, this is an interesting thing that Pilate asks for. How many of you have ever seen paintings or descriptions or pictures of the stone being rolled away and the guards being at the tomb, right? There's a couple of soldiers in miniskirts with spears that are laid out on the ground, right? But in fact, when you think about what, what, what Pontius Pilate asked for, he asked for the guard, the Roman guard. And the Roman guard was a small battalion or a small group of Roman warriors that numbered in 16. Now, scholars believe that they would, they would set the Roman guard out to guard something, that they would be in shifts of four hours so that they can be fresh and as strong as they can be should anything happen. So put this picture in your head. Right? They buried Jesus. He's wrapped up. He's anointed with, with fine oils. He's got spices all over him. They got his face covered. They roll a two-ton stone in front of the entrance of the tomb. And the Roman guard comes and stands watch over the body of Jesus. And these are 16 battle-ready um, uh, Roman soldiers that have been trained to maim and to kill and to destroy anyone that would come against him. So Pilate says, take the guard, go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. So not only do they post 16 of the Roman soldiers in this guard or eight and, and put them on rotation every four hours, but they rolled a two-ton stone in front of the tomb and then they put the Roman seal. Should you break the Roman seal without any authority, you're, you would be put to death and more than likely your family and your friends and everybody that's associated with you 
would be looked upon as rebellious and they would put you to death as well. This was the, the wrath of the Roman law. So in spite of all these precautions, the stone, the soldier, the seals, come on, come Good Friday, Jesus dies on the cross, but on Sunday morning, he still arose from the grave and guards couldn't keep him in the tomb. A two-ton stone couldn't keep him in the tomb. Come on. A seal couldn't keep him in the tomb. And so when the first people arrived to look in, in Matthew 28, 1 through 7, this is what the Bible says. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone, and they sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were like white as snow. And the guards were so afraid, they were so afraid of him, that they shook and became like dead men. You know what, it, you know what it's saying? It basically says that these battle-ready Roman warriors fainted and passed out from the fear of what they were encountering at this moment. And the Bible says, in verse 5, Then the angel said to the women, Don't be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. Come on, he is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples, He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will we'll see him. So here's the powerful testimony of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from an empty tomb. And it's interesting because critics throughout the years have tried to disqualify this. But if you look at the argument that they pose, it doesn't hold any water whatsoever. Think about this with me for just a second. Some of his disciples, some of his disciples who we know on Friday ghosted on him because they were afraid of the persecution that Jesus was experiencing and that it would be attached to them as well. So instead of being by Jesus, they ghost on Jesus. Remember Peter? Peace out. On the third time, he ghosted and he says, I don't even know him. I'm not associated with him. I have nothing to do with him. Peter, the rock, the very first cholo in all of scripture who pulls out the switchblade. You know he must have been Latino. Cuts off the centurion's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane. Come on. That guy. The most hardcore. The one that tells Jesus, you are Jesus. You are the son of God. You have the words of life. Where else would I go? The one that Jesus said, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against you. That guy ghosts on Jesus, turns his back on Jesus, and runs away as a coward because of what took place on that Friday. As a critic throughout the years have not been able to refute the empty tomb. Instead, they've come up with other possibilities, like maybe the disciples stole the body. Like, that doesn't even make sense. They were cowards at this point. For three years, they thought they were down because Jesus was with them. Right? They cast out demons. They saw Jesus raise Lazarus and raise the, the Jairus' daughter from the grave. That he cast out legions of demons out of people. That he healed the blind and restored the lame. And did all these, you know, un, uh, uh, made a wither hand come back to normality. All these things. And yet, on the day that they start getting persecuted on account of Jesus, they ghost on them. And we're like, what a bunch of chumps, right? But the reality is a lot of us have done the same thing. There's a lot of us that have denied Jesus with our lives. There are a lot of us that didn't want to go through a little bit of persecution in the office. They didn't want to get a little bit of persecution at the high school. Come on. They didn't want to get a little bit persecuted by our friends. No, 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 I'm not, I don't go to church anymore. We've all denied Jesus. We might not say it, but we've done it. In our actions, in actions that we should have made and we didn't make, in things that we've said and didn't say, come on. But this seems far-fetched, right? It's not too far-fetched when you keep it real. 
Here's a far-fetched idea when you consider that this group of men and women have turned and burned. They took off on him. They, they had to because they had no way of over a tax collector, a fisherman, prostitute. They're going to come against 16 battle-ready Roman guards. These guys are there standing with shields and swords and spears and mini skirts and, 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 and battle armor and helmets. And these guys have killed probably tens if not hundreds of people. And fishermen and prostitutes and tax collectors are going to fight them for a body? I don't think so. It doesn't hold any water. That just doesn't seem plausible. Another plausibility could have been that the religious leaders maybe stole the body of Jesus. But if they would have stole the body of Jesus, don't you think it would have made more sense to parade the body of Jesus through the streets of Jerusalem and say, he's dead, he is not risen, he died on Friday, and he's still dead today. But it's not what they did. In fact, they went to the Roman authorities and say, hey, he said destroy this temple, and in three days, he'll raise it back up. We don't want anybody to create a scenario that would make it seem that way. So make sure that you secure the tomb and that you make sure that nobody takes his body and nobody comes out of there. So this is just evidence for us that the tomb on Sunday was empty. Come on. The tomb on Sunday couldn't hold Jesus. The security that they had placed to diminish or to disqualify the miracle of God could not hold the miracle of God back from being manifested so that our faith can be birthed. The empty tomb validates the claim of Jesus Christ. John chapter 2, verse 18 through 21 says, the Jews, this is the Jews who asked Jesus, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Now, listen to how they replied to Jesus, right? The way that they replied will tell you that they still didn't get it. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? They're, ta they're talking about the temple of God. But the temple he spoken, he had spoken of was his very own body. And so Jesus predicted that not only are, am I going to be put to death, but on the third day, I'm going to come back from the dead and I will be risen. And they needed more evidence, something that would remove all doubt from their minds. So the empty tomb should be enough evidence for most, but it's not. Can I get a witness? Because that's exhibit B. That's the second thing that we need to look at. Number one is the empty tomb. The fact that a Roman guard filled with warriors, a two-ton stone, and, a, and a, a, a seal and death couldn't keep Jesus in the tomb. Exhibit B is witnesses. Can I get a witness? Right? The witnesses. The early Christians didn't believe Jesus had risen just because of the empty tomb. They believed because they saw him with their very own eyes. When they talked to others about Jesus, they didn't go and say, hey, we ran and found these two angels kicking it with all the Romans like laying down like they were dead and they told us that he would meet us in Galilee. No, they didn't talk about the empty tomb. They said, we saw him with our very own eyes. He's not dead. Jesus is alive. In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, let me remind you again. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. How many know that the number 40 carries an interesting um, uh, uh, tradition attached to it or understanding attached to it? 40 is the number of testing in the Bible. They were in the wilderness for 40 years. It was the time of testing. Jesus was tested and he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Come on. So 40 carries a number attached to it that would, would, would resemble or, or identify a period or a time of testing. Here, for 40 days, 
Jesus is testing everybody's faith. Jesus is spending some time with a lot of people to see if they actually believe that he's not dead and that he is risen. And this is unquestionable because after his resurrection, he made an appearance to the women at the gravesite. Later on that same day, he walked through a closed door and talked with his frightened followers about that he is risen, that he is real. Doubting Thomas is like, I'm not going to believe it unless I put my finger where the holes are in his hands. And Jesus shows up like out of nowhere, doesn't open a door, doesn't ring a doorbell, doesn't throw a Snapchat. He's just like, boom, I'm right here. Here's my hands. Touch it. Here's my rib cage, where the, where the spear went through and blood flowed and water flowed. Go ahead. Put your finger there. I am he that was dead and now I'm alive. And something happened in that moment to the disciples. We'll get that to at the, at the end of this message. In the evening, he walks side by side with two men on the road to Emmaus. And other times, he showed himself to some people in the evening, to others in the daytime, to some in a group, to others singular. The Apostle Paul wrote this to the new Christians in the city of Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15.3. He said, for what I have received... I passed on to you as the first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still alive, through some, though some have fallen asleep. That's interesting, the power of a testimony. The power of a testimony is super important. Has anybody ever gone to court Come on, raise your hand. Don't be scared. We're not going to judge you. Anybody ever here ever gone to court? Right? The power of a testimony can either set you free or even incarcerate you for life. I remember when I was in my late 20s, early 30s, I want to say, I had this really nice um, sports car. It was all done up. And my dad and I were running a business in, in Hollywood, a transmission facility in Hollywood. And one day... Um, I went to go get me and my dad some, some lunch. And so um, I was going down Western. For those of you that are, um, that are familiar with the area, I was going down Western and I was going north uh, to Sunset Boulevard. And on the corner of Sunset and um, Western, there was uh, Carl's Jr. Um, back, back in the day over there. And so I, I was driving anywhere between like 35 and 120. I can't really remember. And no, I'm just kidding like 50 or 60 miles an hour and I shouldn't have been but I was and I was driving my little sports car uh, on the way over there now mind you it this it's got Pirelli you know uh, tires it's got really nice center lines on it Recaro seats airplane Cessna seat belts this thing is like legit it had a gas tank in the front with you know uh, gas tank in the back and I could flow the, the the gasoline from the front tank to the back tank so I didn't have to stop and get gas, but at the same time, it helped me level so I could take turns really good. This is a legit little sports car. I love this little thing. So I was just like, me, 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 you know, just going down, down Western Boulevard, and I don't have a red light. I don't have a stop sign. I've just got freedom, right? And all I remember, something gray came right in front of me, and at about 50, 60 miles an hour, I hit this thing, no brakes. I mean, full on. Boom! And push this thing like 15, 20 feet. The front of my sports car was all the way up to my glass. I had my face was messed up. I had gotten a concussion, you know, uh, but I was alive. I, uh, and then I remembered the gas tank. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, fire, you know? And I'm thinking, I'm, I don't want to burn to death. So I popped the Cessna seatbelt. I got out, I rolled out onto oncoming traffic. It's crazy, all dazed and confused and sober, but dazed and confused. And, and next thing you know, I get pulled over to the side, the ambulance come, the police come, they sit me down, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. They're like, do you wanna to go to the hospital? I'm like, nah, we don't have any insurance. Um, I'll be fine, I just need a Tylenol and some you know, ice, I'll be good. And, um, and so the cops were like, what happened? And I'm like, all I remember was I was going 25 miles an hour. <laughs> Ish. 
and I was, I was traveling down Western. All I saw is something gray pulled in front of me. Come to find out, it was an older model, 280ZX, which was very well made. It was like a 78, 79. Very well made, very heavy. But yet, I plowed into this thing. I, I folded that thing in. And there was a girl in it who, thank God, because of how good the car was built, survived that. But I was like, I don't know. All I know is I hit this thing full on. No brakes, no nothing. And they're like, you're lucky to be alive, blah, 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 blah. They're like, did anybody, did anybody see this? And I'm like, well, I saw like gray. That's all I saw. And there were like two or three people that were standing off to the side. They were like, hey, we saw everything. He was driving down the street. The girl pulled out in front of me, uh, in front of him. He ran like right into her. The rest is history. That's what you see here. And so the cop filled out that information, said, Mr. Vargas, you're fine. You got insurance. Your car's pretty much well totaled. They're taking her to the hospital to make sure that she's okay. But yeah, it's her fault. Now, with all that being said, on the account of two or three witnesses, the police officer declared in that moment that I'm good, that she was wrong, and that if this were to go to court, I would win. Not a problem on account of two or three witnesses. The Bible declares that over 500 people saw Jesus walking and alive. The Bible declares that they had a personal encounter with Jesus. Could you imagine? Jesus, you're, you're going to court today. What are the charges? That you're still dead. That you're not really alive. Your Honor, I call to the stand over 500 and something witnesses that will declare to you today that I didn't die on, a, that I did die on a Friday, but on a Sunday, I arose, and I arose so that whosoever would believe in me would not perish, but they too shall rise and have everlasting life. Did you hear me this morning? 500 witnesses. Could you imagine how long it would take the court to deliberate through 500 I testimonies that Jesus Christ walked amongst them and that he was alive. How can you refute that? How can you, how can you declare anything else? The early church could say, if you don't believe us, you can ask those who saw him with their very own eyes. In Acts 2.32, Peter stands up and declares... Now listen, this is Peter, the one that ghosted on Jesus. This is the Peter that denied Jesus. And this is the Peter that in Acts chapter 2, verse 32 says, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of that fact. Can I get a witness here this morning? Come on. We are all witnesses of that fact. And I find it interesting that Peter preaches his sermon right in the heart of Jerusalem, the very city where Jesus was crucified and buried. And yet there were people that still didn't believe that he was alive. The people knew that the tomb was empty and that Jesus had appeared to hundreds. Peter later wrote a, a, a letter that appears in the Bible, and he wants his readers to know that he didn't make up this resurrection story, that he saw Jesus, that he talked with him, and that he even had some fish and chips with him. 2 Peter chapter 1.16 says, We did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And so exhibit one in our evidence box is the empty tomb. Exhibit two in our evidence box is all the witnesses that have said, I've seen Jesus with my very own eye. Number three is my last point. If I could have our worship team come up, I want to look at the changed or transformed lives that were affected by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Exhibit C is a changed life. I want you to think about this with me for just a moment. Here are all these disciples on Friday that scattered. They ran. They ghosted. They turned their back on Jesus. Even though they saw Lazarus, 
come back from the dead. Even though they saw Jairus' daughter come back from the dead. Even though they saw the withered hand become normal. Even though they saw a legion of demons cast out of a young boy and into a herd of pigs. Even though they saw Jesus do miracles, signs, and wonder. He healed the lame. Come on. He opened blind eyes. He opened deaf ears. He proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. And though they witnessed all that, and they themselves took part in it, they could not stand during the time of his persecution and hold on to their faith and so they ran and many of us have found ourselves in that same stream we go through things in life we struggle through things in life and instead of dealing with the persecution or the trial or the hardship of it instead of sticking it out with Jesus we ghost Peter leaves he goes back to his old life why because when Jesus is risen from the grave who is the first person that he goes and looks for Peter Peter's cooking up some fish and Jesus walks up to him and he goes hey do you love me Peter's like you know that I do he said, feed my sheep Peter do you, do you really love me Lord do you that I do. And he goes through this whole thing with Peter. And I'm so glad, I'm so glad that the grace of God is so expansive that in that moment, the very one that turned his back on, on, on the sun is the very one that's being restored to a right place with the sun by the sun. Jesus takes the initiative to restore Peter back to himself by going and looking for Peter. He restores Peter and he tells Peter, hey, you and the guys are going to have to go into Jerusalem and wait there. I have to go up and be with the Father. But I'm going to send my comforter and he's going to do you with power from on high. And there's going to be a transformation that takes place. Something happened to radically reorient the original group of followers. After Jesus was put to death, think about this with me. After the disciples scattered, the Bible tells us that they were gathered and locked into a room on the top floor of a building in fear. What are we going to do now? Jesus is dead. What are we going to do now? If they killed him, they're going to kill us. That's when Jesus walks into the room. What's up, y'all? Is that you? Yeah, it's me. And something happened because they were filled from fear. They were filled with fear. Their leader had been executed. What's going to happen to them now? John chapter 20 verse 19 says, Let us in on the scene and that would forever change their outlook on, on their lives. On the evening of that first day of the, of, of the week, Easter Sunday evening. So it's Sunday, Easter Sunday evening, same day. When the disciples were together, the, the doors locked out of fear. Jesus came in and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Their witness helped the transformation take place from a spirit of fear to a spirit of joy. And the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And God says, peace be with you. My peace be with you. This overwhelming peace cut through their own guilt and feelings of failure, and it was replaced with the joy of a risen Savior. Peter had been transformed from a coward who had denied Christ three times to the very rock on whom one of the pillars of the church would be built upon. And this ordinary man and these ordinary people went on to do extraordinary things and tr they transformed, uh, they were transformed from frightened wimps into the most effective missionary crew that ever saw the face of this earth. In, ex in Acts chapter 4 verse 33 the Bible says with great power the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus that God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. So what does this all mean? Exhibit A. The empty tomb. 
It doesn't matter what the enemy tries to do to disqualify the miracle of God that God wanted to do in Jesus. A tomb, a rock, a guard, a seal cannot hold back the power of the resurrection Christ. And I'm here to declare to everyone in here this morning that that same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that that same power that rolled away that stone, that that same power that caused the guard of Rome to fall in fear and faith that the very same power that took Jesus out of that cave out of that tomb, out of that grave is the same power that's at work in every single one of your lives and can take you from what the enemy wanted to do to defeat you it's a resurrection power for you to testify of the goodness of God come on when you know that you know that you know that you've had an encounter an encounter with the most high god nobody can tell you any different and you go from being frightened lambs to brave as a lion where you would stand in the streets of jerusalem and declare to all those that crucified him that god's not dead he is alive and that you need to repent of all your sin. What you're witnessing and encountering right now is the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit, the very one that you crucified. But we declare today that God's not dead, that He is alive. What, what's her motivation? Is it money? No. Is it fame? No. Is it power? No. Their motivation wasn't, you know, a, a, a good tweet. Their motivation wasn't this cool little video made for Instagram. Their motivation wasn't these motivational speakers that are super shallow in so many ways. Their motivation is they saw Jesus. Their motivation is that they were transformed by the power that resurrected Jesus. Their motivation was there is no other way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and their life. And they were so motivated that they were willing to lay down their own lives. Would you lay your life down for a lie? Would you? Would you even if it just sounded good, would you give up your life for a lie? I, I mean, look, look, at, look at the way these guys laid down their life. Matthew was killed in Ethiopia by a sword. Mark was dragged through the streets of Egypt by horses until he was dead. Peter, Simon, Andrew, and Philip were crucified. Peter said, I'm not worthy to be crucified the way that Jesus was. And they crucified him upside down. James was beheaded. Bartholomew was filleted alive. Thomas was pierced with lances. James the less was thrown off of the temple and then stoned to death. Jude was shot to death with arrows. Paul was boiled in hot oil and then beheaded. Luke was hanged in Greece. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Greece and Barnabas was stoned to death in Salonika. Would they do all that for a lie? I would say to you today that Exhibit C declares that these transformed lives had an encounter with the Most High God and that they saw not only His death, not only His burial, but they witnessed His resurrection. And because you and I believe, we are blessed because they were believed, they, they were blessed because they saw and believed. Jesus said that you and I are even more blessed because we didn't see it, but we believe it today. Come on. We believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thanks for tuning in to this week's message. I hope that it spoke to you in some way. But don't stop here. Click the link below to learn more about Restoration Life Church. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel, and we hope that you join us next week.